Hello, and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. This week, our guest is the director of Russian Studies Program at the Center for Naval Analysis and an expert military analyst specializing in the Russian Armed Forces, Michael Kaufman. Also, in our regular weekly segment on battleground states from Ohio, we have Howard Wilkinson, the dean of Ohio political reporters, now at WVXU in Cincinnati. And remember, we love taking your questions, so write to politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. Well, now, we'll get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the links to our sponsors, Blinkist and Miracle Brand, in the show notes. We thank you for supporting our sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Hey, James, um, I, want, I want you to pick up uh, on the new, what seems to be the new conventional wisdoms that Democrats have lost their momentum. Republicans are back in the driver's seat for the midterm. But first, we have to talk about Herschel Walker, the, f- <laughs> the, the former Heisman Trophy r- Georgia running back and now GOP Senate candidate, even though he hadn't lived in the state for years, has been caught in a series of lies, uh, said he was top of his class, never graduated, law enforcement officer wasn't. But the the granddaddy uh, of all this week was when the Daily Beast reported that Walker, who says he's strongly anti-abortion, paid a girlfriend some years ago to have an abortion. Now, the woman wasn't identified, but she did produce a receipt for the abortion, a $700 check, presumably from Walker, uh, and to cover the cost, and a get-well card. Now, he, of course, denied it, and Republicans rallied his defense. It's too late to replace him. They have no choice. And Quislings like Ralph Reed said, you know, Herschel's fine. But his 23-year-old son, his son, I want to point out, said his father is a liar, and he was, quote, not, you're not a family man when you left us to bang a bunch of women and threaten to kill us. James, even in the era of Trump, this has to hurt. Well, I, I think in a, in, a, in a more civilized country, we would force him to go through concussion protocols because there's, there's something that's not right there. So I want to talk a little bit about these conservative evangelicals like Ralph Reed. All right? So, all right, you, you paid for an abortion nine what, nine years ago. No, I don't know. What, 13 whatever, years what, ago. 13, think, 13 yeah. years ago. All right, people get themselves in a tight jam. Of course, you wouldn't want to afford that option to anybody else, and thank God, because it's just been another kid that you would have ignored, and we hardly need that in the world. So, But you can, you can forgive that. Or you can forgive murder. That, that, that's done all the time. And what about one kid out of wedlock by one woman? No, nah, two kids out of wedlock by two women. No, nah, three kids out of wedlock by three women. No, nah, four. Four. And they're piously spouting off about family values and and how the youth of America has become detached from religion because they're all playing video games. I don't know what. You think anybody looks at that and says, I really want to be a part of that? When they look at that massive, staggering hypocrisy that emanates from a place like the First Baptist Church in Atlanta? And they say, no. These, these, these people stand for nothing, and if you, all they care about is money and a donation, a Sunday collection, and hurting, you know, lower middle class people. That, that's, that's their mission in life. And this, it, this really, you know, Trump exposed them, of course. We'd, you know, they'd grab, grab them by the way, that, do it, everything you want. They didn't care. And, you know, uh, pay for an abortion, they don't care. Uh, have four kids, beat women, they don't care. Don't talk to your children, don't pay child support, they don't care. So I, 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 I think, it, I, I don't know, you know, nothing, I expect they'll continue their behavior, but at least it's exposed them and it's good when they get exposed. Couldn't agree more. James, as a quick aside, I would say I know you're a big SEC fan, but with Herschel Walker and Alabama Senator Tommy <laughs> Tuberville, former <laughs> Auburn coach, who didn't know there were three branches of government, um, right. I, you know, maybe just stick to the gridiron. <laughs> yeah, I, I have an a, a emergency nomination I want to vote on for the Ivy League Sink the Hall of Fame. Who's that? Forgot about Stuart Rhodes. 
Is he an Ivy Ligger? The, uh, yes, the uh, Oath Yale, Keeper? A graduate of Yale Law School. Oh, my gosh. And well, so you, you concurred and did, did this merits a, a, an emergency right, introduction? Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we've got to get back in a couple of weeks to some more right. sphincter, Ivy League sphincter right. Hall of Fames. But, I mean, this is a, this is, there's no waiting period for that. Uh, you just put him in automatically. I agree. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, we don't we suspend the rules and bring you right up to Cooperstown. Absolutely. <laughs> there, I, I followed it a little bit. In their theory, their defense is about the most ridiculous defense. You know, you got to defend something. I don't blame boy. He's got to come up with something. That, that they were standing by for the Insurrection Act because it was a militia. We had a militia in this country since 1907. But at any rate, he's, Stuart, you've, you've made the big time. You, you're, you're right up there with Alan Dershowitz. Oh, right. And, of course, Donald Trump has always of been course, the, uh, course, the, the CEO, course, course. but uh, there's well, a lot of other people there. Tom, out Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, <laughs> yeah. Sam Alito. Yeah. I got a lot um, of company. Back on the, on the political front, James, the conventional wisdom, as I said now, is that uh, the, all the momentum is switched to Republicans. I don't, I don't see that anybody has momentum right now. I, I do think that Democrats had some momentum toward the end of August, or whatever. The, I, maybe it, it, it's good, you can make a case that it's stalled. All right? Exactly. Uh, it, but I, don't, I wouldn't make a case much beyond that. And now the prediction market has it at 31 percent uh, to win the House back. Uh, you know, if, if it keeps going up, I, 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 I don't know. I've seen a slew of Senate polls. And, uh, you know, I mean, we're not, you just get ready. You're going to see a lot of 48, 48 polls around the country. Yeah. That's just what's going to happen. No, I agree. Look, one of the reasons the Democrats came back so strongly over the summer was, of course, the Supreme Court decision on abortion. And they, that is a very good issue in most places for Democrats. I do think now they have to stay on the issue, but rather than just generalize, they have to talk about some of the particular cases. There was an awful one down in Louisiana that was that uh, young 10-year-old uh, out in, uh, out in uh, what Ohio. What about Arizona? And, yeah, and uh, so, so those, I mean, I think it's, it's fine. I mean, you need to talk about a woman's right to choose, uh, but, but let's say, hey, this is not just a, uh, you know, a philosophical question. This has huge impact, but I, I, I think you're right. I think it's too soon to say that uh, anybody has momentum. But, but also, it's way too, too soon for Democrats to despair. I mean that you know you had a you, you know you had a good summer, and you have an okay September, but you're not you, you, they're not advancing on you. I don't you know maybe in a place or two, but it, it's all pretty problematical. Yeah, and the but, Senate you know, races. No, this 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 abortion thing that you know you might have you might have a, a lot of women coming out of woodwork and vote. I I'm, I I don't know that it certainly happened in Kansas, and. Uh, well, that's I'm, one I'm of the. Uh, that couldn't happen. That's one of the quandaries I think now, and I think pollsters, by and large, do a very good job. One side says, "Hey, once again, they're undercounting the um, low right. propensity uh, Trump type Republican voters." But there's also a case, as you just said, that maybe if you look at Kansas and other places, there are going to be women who all have, have tended to be low propensity voters who are going to turn out. So you know, I, I, I think it's it, it's just about where it was uh, l l a couple weeks ago. Take a minute here to talk about polling for a second, because in your Korean journalism, you were, you know, part wrote and supervised, you know, hundreds of polls. You, you covered hundreds, maybe a thousand polls in your career. I don't know how many polls I saw. And, and there's, when you see it on TV, you say, well, this is a, a Republican poll, this is a Democratic poll, or this poll says this. The, the one thing I, I'll say with a high degree of confidence, most pollsters, I, I I mean, really, most of them really want to get it right. I mean, there's no shade. To, most of the Democratic pollsters I know, if anything, they shade the numbers a little bit the other way. Yep. But, but and, and, you know, like Trafalgar Group or Rasmussen, I think they have a pretty well-deserved uh, reputation for overstating Republican strength. But you know what? They, they understated Trump's strength. They un uh, Brazil, where the polls have traditionally been really good. I mean, I've worked in Brazil... And they had huge samples, and they under, underrated uh, Balsandro. So uh, it, it's a good discussion to have. 
I think you, you and I can both tell our viewers with a great deal of confidence. The Poland industry is working on this. They're cognizant of it. They, they're doing everything they can to get it right. No, I think that's absolutely right. The reason I'm very suspicious of something like Trafalgar, most pollsters, Republicans right. and Democrats, are, are polling for candidates or for PACs or for leadership um, uh, leadership funds. They don't just put out you know every poll they do unless their their candidate wants them to. Uh, and when I see a Trafalgar poll out virtually every day, uh, it makes me a bit suspicious. I think they're trying to attract hey, attention. Yeah. You, know, you know, something that uh, the average person can do would probably make sense is be like a Olympic, you know, gymnast score. Take throw out the high the high pole, throw out the low pole, and register. Yeah. Rest, you know, yeah. average the rest. That's right. And that I, might give you a little better result. I agree. Okay, we'll keep following this. Hey, James, there's never been a better time to continue learning, build knowledge, and work towards your goals than right now. And Blinkist helps you to discover and understand key insights and powerful ideas from books and podcasts in record time with Blinks and Shortcast. Imagine discovering new perspectives, having exciting conversations, and finding those aha moments you've been looking for. It's easier than ever with Blinkist. Blinkist offers the best selection of nonfiction books and podcasts condensed down to 15 minutes for immediate inspiration and mastery. They offer over 5,500 titles, 5,500 in 27 categories in their unique, entertaining, and engaging audio format. It's perfect no matter where you are or what you're doing and whether it's for education and or pleasure. Not only is Blinkist easy and enjoyable to use, you can even listen and read at the same time by downloading titles for offline access. And while celebrating their 10-year anniversary, Blinkist launched a totally new function that's going to be your favorite feature ever. Think of all those great ideas you naturally want to share and discuss with others instead of just keeping them to yourself. Blinkist Connect does just that. Blinkist Connect allows all premium users to share your account with another person of your choice. So you effectively get two premium accounts for the price of one at zero cost. That way you can easily share blinks and shortcasts with each other with just one click. Boy, James, I got something I really want to share with you. At the moment, that's Sleepwalkers by Christopher Clark from the Expert Picks category. It covers how Europe went to war in 1914 and compares it with the current geopolitical situation over there. It's a fascinating subject and one we ought to think about and worry about right now. There are a lot of other incredible history titles on Blinkist, but you can learn more about any topic you can think of with Blinkist. That's pretty great, James. It's really great. Now, I, I keep saying, we've got to get one of these guys on to explain how to do this. So the sleepwalkers, I, I assign that, uh, to my Tulane class in 2014, which was the 100th anniversary in Chris Clark's book. And it's, it would be dense. Most I, I gotta, I'll be honest with you, I, re, I read most of it. I read a lot about it. And it's one of the most interesting stories in history that I don't even think that Clark totally settles it is the origins of World War One. Uh, my favorite explanation for the origins of World War One is when Bismarck said the next war is going to become some damn fool thing in the Balkans. And, of course, I married somebody from the Balkans. <laughs> and I, I don't know if that was the total cause of the start of World War One, but it, it probably had something to do with it. But the, the Clark book is, is amazing because it, it goes back and forth. And it, 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 he's a little unclear on... You, you, you know, our history is it was all Germany's fault. Now, it was some of, you know, Germany's fault. Fascinating, fascinating topic, fascinating book. And you can read it or you can get it on Blinkist uh, and, yeah. and get... It's the only way. I'm getting yep. it. That's the only way to read it. You, you, it unless you're a, a scholar... Uh, of World War One, that that book is is scholarship is, is what it more scholarship than it is story. You know, right now Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to blinkist.com/slash/warroom to start your seven-day free trial and get twenty-five percent off of a Blinkist Premium membership. That's Blinkist spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash warroom to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Again, Blinkist.com slash warroom. And now for a limited time, 
You can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account so you get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. You can also look for the link in our show notes. Hey, when we asked Steve Kotkin, the great Russian expert, what information he trusts uh, about the Ukraine war, the first mention was Michael Kaufman. I got the same answer yesterday from a very high former Defense Department official. Michael, a native of Kiev, is director of the Russian Studies Program at the Center for New American Security. We are delighted to have you with us today, Michael. So let me just start. The remarkable Ukraine offensive in the north now be on the verge, now may be on the verge of taking Kherson region, further humiliation for the Russians, and actually could have an effect on uh, Crimea. What's the outlook? Well, I mean, the outlook for Russian forces is obviously not very good. I mean, right now, Ukrainian forces have the momentum and the initiative, at least for the next month, until it becomes a bit more difficult to run offensive operations due to the change in the weather. But I think at this stage, on two separate fronts, one in the east uh, around Luhansk and Donetsk, and one in the southwest in Kherson, Russian forces are essentially in retreat on both fronts in Ukraine. So that's the... That's remarkable. Yeah, Michael, talk about the job the Ukrainians have done in undermining the sustainability of the Russian army. Well, it depends on what we mean by sustainability, right? Uh, I think the main impact that Ukraine has had is by using HIMARS systems. HIMARS allow uh, operational sort of depth strike and allowed Ukraine over the summer to really start coming after Russian logistics and mostly interfering with the flow of Russian ammunition to, to artillery at the line. Uh, but all the sustainability issues uh, really generate from trying to use force at scale. It's actually very hard to employ military power on a large scale. Few countries can do it. Probably only the United States has been doing this in the past several decades. We're trying to field a lot of forces across a vast battlefield over a thousand kilometers with multiple fronts, supplying them, commanding them. It's a very significant challenge. And the Russian military struggled extensively with us. Uh, most militaries you see in, in the modern age have, have difficulty, especially if you want to try to engage in more complex forms of operations. The more you scale, the more difficult it becomes. And the Russian military will struggle with sustaining the war effort going into the winter because then, then uh, the demand for supply will, will only increase. Well, as important as the weapons that have been supplied from uh, the U.S. and the Western allies, isn't, isn't it equally important is the intelligence? The Ukrainians seem to know a hell of a lot more about the Russians are doing than the Russians know about them. Yeah, gee, I wonder where that is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that t- talk about that a little bit, uh, about the importance of intelligence in this conflict. I mean... I really can't. So I'll say that, yes, intelligence is really important. And I don't think it takes all of effort to figure out that Ukraine benefits extensively from intelligence cooperation with the United States and other countries. Yeah. You, you, you wrote that Putin has staked his regime on the outcome of this war. Now, over the weekend, some you know, pretty, pretty smart American military experts like generals David Petraeus and Barry McCaffrey say Russians cannot win this war. So what? That's a that's that really poses a, you know a lot of issues. If they if they've staked the regime on the outcome of the war and they can't win, what's that mean? Okay, well I'm not going to go off of the assessment of retired American generals. With, with many respects to my colleagues in the military community, American generals are not always the best predictors of what can and can't that's, be won. That's true. <laughs> So uh, with, that, with that in mind, uh, Russia is certainly not winning this war. It's losing it right now at this stage. And it's not clear what the future holds, because here I want to be very cautious. Wars don't end the way they begin, and lots of people fall victim to straight-line analysis. Wars have inflection points, and they have phases. Right? And I think folks throughout have been a bit impatient in this war instead of trying to think about think about it as a war that's likely to go on. 
most, most wars tend to go on longer than people want them to or expect. But I think the truth was very much that the regime has staked itself and has committed itself to this war. As of about two weeks ago, they were trying to fight it in every possible way without doing that. And Putin's regime is principally not a mobilization regime. Yes, it's a personalist authoritarian system, but it primarily depends on public apathy and public essentially uh, treating this war uh, as one that they didn't have to care very much about it that may not especially affect their lives. And all of that changed as of two weeks ago. In some respects, this war really began uh, for the Russian public only a couple of weeks back. So now that the regime's committed itself to this war, it doesn't have a good way out. And by following through with annexation, they have no uh, basis for negotiations with Ukraine moving forward. Right? So, if it, so if it is going to be a defeat, it's going to be a very significant defeat uh, with, with dire implications for, for Putin's regime, I think. James. So, so my, I want to uh, drill down on, on the word you used. You described what the Russians were doing in the eastern Ukraine as a retreat. It, it seems to be a little bit more like a rout. And that when you think of a retreat, there's some kind of orderly pullback to a more defensible position. A rout is when you're running and leaving your shit out in the open. It, 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 what percent of this is a retreat and what percent is a rout? Yeah, well, the distinction between retreat and rout is really in terms of cohesion and organization, right? And the extent to which uh, you retain uh, command and control over the forces involved. Uh, look, it's very hard to tell tactically because I'm not there. And most of the other people commenting right. on it are also not there either, right? But you talk to people that are there. You got a better idea sure. than some guy that fell off the turnip Sure, truck. that's very true. So I would say that um, in some areas, it's definitely been a panicked retreat. In Izum, before they had to retreat from Liman, there were definitely parts of it that were around. In Liman, it looks a bit more organized than it was in Izum. But in many cases, uh, the challenge you have is that you're not dealing so much with a Russian military that's very cohesive anymore. You're dealing with a lot of forces that Russia's using. Reserves, mobilized personnel from Luhansk and Donetsk, right? Rosguardia, which is Russian National Guard. So as the war is going on, you've had far less of actually any regular Russian military in the war. So increasingly, it's very hard for them to, I think, operate as any kind of cohesive force because they're not. Okay, so I sit here, you know, I'm not just a historian or anything, but I read a lot of history, read a lot of Russian history, I've been there. And uh, I say to myself, well, shit, they always do poorly at the beginning of any war. They got clobbered in, in you know, June of 1941. They got clobbered, in, you know, to 1812. And, you know, they, they, they come back and they amass and, you know, and they end up the Soviet steamroller or czars, whatever. It, this strikes me is, and we've had other military analysts on, they, their troops are not very well trained at all. They have a depleted NCO Corps. It, it, is, how hard is it going to be for Putin to whip this army back into any kind of fighting shape? Because it's clearly not there now. Yeah, no, the Russian military is off in a bad way. A lot of the better parts of that army, such as it was, and it wasn't a particularly good army, have already been lost in this war. Uh, now, I think there's simply a Russian dependence increasingly on numbers, quantity, on uh, perhaps an advantage of having a greater amount of ammunition and greater amount of fires for artillery. That's about it. Right now, Russian military is actually in its most vulnerable and dire state heading into the winter. So uh, the truth is that at this stage, Russian leadership cannot count on being able to uh, generate sort of a dramatic amount of additional military power the way they might have in the past in, in previous cases to overcome uh, the current deficits on the battlefield. The other thing is, is actually Russia's lost quite a few wars. Yes, it depends kind of when you read Russian history which cases you like. Great right. powers lose right. wars all the time. Superpowers do too, okay? <laughs> a lot of people, for whatever reason, don't exclude this from their historical record, but they do. Right. And, and, and Russia's right. lost plenty of wars. You can compare this to the Russo-Japanese War, 
the Crimean War. Ooh. There's plenty of them where, where Russia actually doesn't overcome. Um, so would that... They lost the Cold War. Yeah. Uh, sure. Or, you know, World War One, where Russia has to sign the fairly humiliating treaty of, of Brest-Litovsk, um, uh, Afghanistan. So like, just, just the list can go on. My point in this whole story is that yeah, Russia can very well lose this war. Right now it's heading into more of a defeat than anything else. And its options are not great, but mobilization may extend the war. It may extend Russia's ability to keep the war going. The historical record you started with, Joe, I think is very accurate. The Russian military usually performs poorly at the beginning of any war for a particular reason, which is the Russian political leadership almost always ensures that the military is in the worst possible position at the start of a war, no matter whether they're the ones declaring the war or they're the ones defending it. So uh, you're talking about Russian defeats and their effect. What comes to mind is Tsushima, uh, which was a naval battle that they, they got waxed in and that most people think that contributed to the downfall of the Tsar. But there was 12 years between Tsushima and the October Revolution. Uh, do you see that this will, is, is this eroding Putin's power base? Is it, is it that significant that it could lead to some change in Russian leadership? Man, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm pretty skeptical on that score. I think it is definitely- right. well, Please be honest. Yeah, I, I think, look, on the one hand, it's totally eroding the legitimacy of Putin's regime. That's true. I don't think it'll necessarily lead to to his downfall, and I also don't don't really fall into the category of those who read Russian history as one where wars have have led to these major um, uh, major uh, uh, political shifts. Although, in a, in a case of the failed offensive by the interim government after after the first revolution, yes, that 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 was an important factor in the Bolshevik Revolution. But we're not going to go down that rabbit hole because I, I for, yeah. Right. So. Before I turn it back to Al, I got, I got the money question here. Uh, our friend Walter Pincus, who is very, very knowledgeable about national security, says that don't think that using a nuke that Trump, I mean, uh, that Putin just has like a button on his desk and can charge it, that they have a certain protocol that they have to go through. It, based on what you know, how hard internally would it be for Putin to launch a, a nuclear attack? Okay, it's harder than having a red button on your desk that you just press, but it doesn't have that many uh, uh, I don't put it, intervening measures from my point of view. At the end of the right. day, he is the person that decides on nuclear employment. Yes, there are other people in the chain that have to implement, right? But you mm -hmm. need to always assume that they will follow through, just like in many ways you would in our system, right? You cannot bank on the fact that somebody in uh, in within the, the military administration it is going to uh, refuse an order. And keep in mind, here's the challenge with systems like that. They have a high amount of redundancy. So typically, if somebody refuses an order in that system, they'll find somebody who will follow through afterwards. So before I turn it out, I'll take everybody to go with me. Watch Doctor Strange Love. It's so much better than you thought, and it's so relevant today. It's just, it's just staggering. Go ahead, Al. Uh, Michael, let me <clears throat> let me come back to that <clears throat> the ill-prepared Russian army. I, I mean, they, they. We talked about how good the Ukrainian intelligence is. Clearly, their intelligence was just terrible. They they weren't prepared to fight a moving army, a mobile army. Uh, there seems to have been a breakdown in, in training and leadership. What is their command control and the caliber of their generals? Man, I'm not sure I'd say that that's really the issue in the Russian military. I'd say that the Russian military was built for a much more of a short, sharp war with NATO. And it wasn't designed to invade what is de facto the second largest country in Europe. It certainly, uh, as a military, they had big trade-offs in it. For example, they cut a lot of the infantry, they cut a lot of the elements of the force that would allow it to conduct strategic ground offensives. And that made it nearly impossible for them to execute this kind of invasion. And originally was planned clearly by political leadership as a regime change operation. And it was both influenced by prior uh, sort of Russian, uh, Russian efforts like this or Soviet efforts like this, for example, Operation Danube, but also in some ways it looked like a very, very poor attempt to imitate the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 03. And actually the things in that invasion that didn't go very well. 
So, so from Thunder Runs to a very bad Russian cheap attempt to imitate Shokana and things like that. Uh, and so in many ways, you saw early on a lot of the Russian military was lost. It took very significant casualties in the first couple of weeks. And the operation was goal was regime change, but whose premise was, was really not viable, right? The political objectives couldn't be attained with that kind of military means. And since then, the Russian military had fallen back on Plan B, which is a very traditional plan for the Russian armed forces, attrition. Russian military is culturally an artillery army with lots of tanks, okay? So it generally fights a war based on artillery and heavy amounts of attrition. And they tried to fight the war that way all the way through the summer. And then eventually that military became exhausted. It ran out of momentum, started having Ukrainians started to stabilize the situation. And then over time, Ukraine had a huge advantage in manpower. The Russians, Russians had a structural deficit of manpower throughout, throughout this war. And many of the advantages that the Ukrainian military had could eventually uh, be brought together for a series of successful uh, concurrent offensives at the end of August and beginning of September. And now that's created a lot of operational derailments for the Russian armed forces, and you see that they're, they're in, in fairly uh, steady retreat. But throughout this war, there's been a very obvious mismatch between Russian political goals and the military means they have available. And this is fundamentally a failure of strategy at the very top, right? Military strategy is political in nature. It's supposed to connect military operations to the political goals, right? Otherwise, it's not clear what it's doing for you. And it's very obvious that Russian political leadership has also been just fundamentally detached from the military realities of this war and what they can and can't accomplish. And, and as you said, they're now, uh, they're now uh, mobilizing, I guess, what, 200,000 more men. But aren't they likely to be even less prepared than the first batch? Yeah, it's actually not clear how many men they're mobilizing. The numbers they put out, put right. out are kind of, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't pay too much attention to them. But they're mobilizing quite a bit of manpower. I think initially their goal is to desperately try to stabilize their lines and then to try to create potentially additional units. Yeah, they will be less trained than the other soldiers that have already been in this fight. That is for sure. Okay, but Russia right now is probably just going to throw bodies at the problem. Michael, what are the risks now for the Ukrainians? They've had, they've done incredibly well uh, in the recent months, but what, 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 are, what are the risks for them now? What do you worry about for them? But too many people get complacent that American generals say that the war's already won. No, but uh, right. but but not to, <laughs> sorry, I'm a big cheeky. We're gonna dis we're gonna disregard those generals. No, no, so I, go I, ahead, Michael. I appreciate that perspective. I'm just being a big cheeky. Um, uh, so the the main dangers are first the risk of escalation, and Russia doesn't have too many conventional escalation options, but they are there. For example, counter value strikes against critical infrastructure. We've already seen quite a number of these in uh, recent months. Things like power plants, dams, the kind of things that a country really needs to be able to survive the winter, right? You may, you may see success on the battlefields, but remember, this war has done great injury to the Ukrainian economy. Cities destroyed, a lot of GDP lost, a lot of population lost, right? So from just a narrow military lens, this may look like a wonderful success to some extent. But keep in mind, a lot of Ukrainian territory is still occupied. A lot of the economy has been destroyed. The country has to still survive through just this coming winter alone. These are, uh, so these, are, these are things that I think are a great concern to Ukrainians. Next, what does this war look like coming out of the winter, right? It's, the winter is going to be about uh, attrition and forced reconstitution. And for Ukraine, the main, the main concerns are uh, having an adequate supply of ammunition because they're incredibly dependent on us, having an adequate supply of equipment because, again, in this category, they're rather dependent on us and on, on other European countries. And uh, down the line, uh, throughout sort of economic support as well, that's a major factor because we focus way too much on the military. But if this war becomes more protracted, right, you hope for a shorter war. But, you know, my job as an analyst is always to plan around the more worst case scenarios and be conservative. And you can be optimistic, but, you know, hope is not a plan. So you sort of you can yeah. be optimistic about a shorter war, but you have to plan for the longer run. That's the main Ukraine concern is what does this war look like if it drags out through 2023? 
I'm going to go back to James, uh, Michael, but just I want to return to the nuclear question for a, uh, a moment. As, as you said, you know, he's a man that makes the decision. But there, there are those who say that tactical nuclear weapons, for all the devastation they cause, they, their, their military utility may be less than people suppose, and the diplomatic uh, ramifications could be disastrous. Yeah, I don't quite agree with that. My answer to that is it all depends. You don't. Uh, it really all depends. So tactical nuclear weapon battlefield efficacy really depends on how they're used and against what. That's a bit of a technically complex discussion. I will say this, in the last few weeks of conversations on nuclear weapons online, I feel I've learned a great deal about nuclear weapons that isn't true. So uh, I'd be very cautious in this, in, this, uh, in this space. I will say this, that I don't think when, when we're discussing nuclear escalation, the conversation is actually about battlefield use of tactical nuclear weapons. The conversation is first and foremost about use of nuclear weapons for demonstration purposes, then potential use of nuclear weapons against specific types of military or civilian targets is a limited form of escalation and of coercion, not battlefield use of tactical nuclear weapons against active military formations, as you might have imagined it in the 1960s and 70s. Okay. That said, I am puzzled by the theory that tactical nuclear weapons have very little battlefield effects because it's very difficult to explain both the U.S. offset strategy, all right, throughout 1960s and 70s and the Soviet Union's too. Is the theory then that the United States and the Soviet Union were colossally wasting their time procuring thousands upon thousands of tactical nuclear weapons? Because it really upends a lot of thinking on evolution of nuclear strategy and utility of battlefield nuclear weapons. Basically, but my point here being is it doesn't really scan with a lot of the history on the subject. Right. James? So, so Michael, it, of course, I'm, I'm not there. I'm hardly a military expert. But it, it just seems to me that the Ukrainian army is getting stronger and the Russian army is getting weaker. Yep. All right, and we're getting ready to go into the winter. What will... And, and I understand you, you have to take a very cautious and wars last long and you, you don't discount a, a, a country like Russia with that kind of uh, authoritative leadership, population, military tradition, et cetera. Well, what happens if Putin's generals go to him next spring and say, we're not going to win this, uh, Mr. President. We, they, 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 the U.S. keeps sending them stuff. Their troops are better trained, they're better equipped, they're better supplied. And we just, we, we're not going to be able to even hold what we got. What, what, what do you think Putin's reaction would be? I mean, to be honest, I think they've already done that. There's been some interesting articles in the last couple of weeks discussing that subject that I read in the press. I think that he's, fun to, he's been uh, pretty, pretty detached and unrealistic about the prospects of the military to turn us around. And, and he's actually gone through with annexing territory that not only does the Russian military not fully control, but effectively can't defend, right? So he's now in, in practice losing Russian territory. Uh, no, I, it's, it's a really good question. I think what she says is absolutely right. The Ukrainian military has since the summer been getting stronger and the Russian military has been getting weaker. And to me, major wars ultimately come down to, you know, attrition and to which force can reconstitute better and then begin imposing major operational dilemmas on their opponent. And the Ukrainians have been able to do that. So on this trajectory, no matter what Ukraine accomplishes before the winter, it's in a much better position coming out of the winter right now than the Russian armed forces. So what's going to happen after that? Well, I think the Russian political ship has had three options in the past month, right? The first one was retrenchment withdraw, rev uh, revise down political objectives, and, and essentially hope to get a ceasefire or a negotiation on the basis of occupying far less territory that may be more defensible. They've clearly chosen against that, right? The second one was mobilization, and hope that they could turn around the phase general mobilization to a lot more manpower and achieve something going that route. And the third one was escalation. And they weren't mutually exclusive, but it's just very clear which one they've gone for, right? So mobilization doesn't work. I think that that's really when the conversation on escalation is likely to, to take off. And that's what concerns me. I think that at this stage, the risk of nuclear escalation is quite low. And the conversation actually seems a little too active in, in the public space. 
but that in the long term, right, or if we at least look out uh, into next year, then given the fact that the regime has fully committed itself to this war, the likelihood of escalation is growing. Uh, how do they escalate without nuclear weapons? So he says, I want to, how can they escalate anymore? So the, the options at this stage are pretty, are pretty limited. They can conduct conventional strikes against critical infrastructure, right? Things, hit things that they haven't hit before. They can uh, attempt a more general uh, set of, of cyber attacks, but in many cases, higher levels of escalation would probably involve uh, the Russian armed forces either trying to directly level cities that are proximate to the border, like Kharkiv, right? And we're expanding uh, the escalation, the escalation dynamic to uh, Europeans and the United States. And the, the destruction of NS1 and NS2 pipelines, Nord Stream 1 and NS2, may be a signal that that's just the beginning. Wow. Uh, well, thank you very much, you know, illuminating it. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but there's a lot of things that have happened. Well, you know, no, that's why we have you on the show, man. Yeah. I mean, that's what, you know, that's what our, our, our listeners want to know, what, what's, you know, the best that you can tell us what's going on. Boy, and you sure have done that. Michael, right. you're, you're a, um, you were born in Kiev. Do you still have relatives over I there? I don't. Uh, b bulk of my family left Ukraine over the last 30 years. I, c I came to the U.S. at the, the beginning of the 90s. But you're still talking to people oh, over the there? All the time. I have a lot of yeah. friends. I have a lot yeah. of colleagues there. I have a lot of people that are uh, doing analysis or reporting from near the front lines, so on a daily basis. And, and how would you describe their mood today? I mean, I think their mood, uh, as far as how the war is going, is quite positive. But also, okay, far less euphoric compared to Western commentators because they understand that they have a right. difficult winter ahead, right? They've lost a lot. The economic sustainability of the country is very much, you know, something that's on people's minds. And uh, they're, they're much more focused on the more medium and long term, right, beyond these battlefield victories. Remember, one of, the, one of the frustrating things about war is, yes, Russia's losing, but it's up to the loser to decide when the war is over. So Putin, in some respects, cannot concede defeat. He can just sort of keep the wars going, even, even as Russian forces have lost control over a lot of this territory. So that's, I think, I think the, the mood in general there is, yes, this is good, but Ukraine still needs a lot when it comes to weapons, equipment, ammunition, and it needs a lot of economic support to, to try to uh, make it through this conflict. Yeah. Well, as James said, Michael, we have learned a great deal, uh, both about what we know and what we don't know, <clears throat> and not to always rely on American generals. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I'm just being naughty. I'm being I, naughty. I think it's good. <laughs> that's good. Well, we, they, they, they deserve that. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much. We really have learned a lot, and I uh, hope you're well and to stay in touch. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thanks for having me on your podcast. As you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality. And if you wake up too hot or too cold, we highly recommend you check out Miracle Brand self-cooling bed sheets. Inspired by silver-infused fabrics made by NASA, Miracle Brand makes temperature-regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Since we started using Miracle Brand self-cooling bed sheets, we stay comfortable every night. All night, thanks to Miracle Brand's thermoregulating sheets, unique self-cooling properties. Even better, they're self-cleaning, thanks to their infusion of natural silver that prevents 99.9% .9 of bacterial growth. They stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. So forget those sheets with gross odors. Instead, Miracle Sheets which are also luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. Their sheets use a premium 500 thread count sateen weave that's made with a USA grown Sapima cotton, one of the highest quality cottons in the world. So stop sleeping on bacteria. Instead, go to Miracle Brand Sheets. Their design makes them so much better for your skin with less bacteria to clog your pores, which means fewer breakouts and other skin problems. They're cool, comfortable and perfect for a great sleep 
You agree, James Carville. Well, not only do I agree, I, I have an idea, and I, I want all of our listeners to listen very carefully, and if any of the executives are, are, are listening, please listen carefully. I'm, I'm going to tell you what's going on in southwest Florida. First of all, it's hot. Secondly, there is no electricity. Third, they are, they're, they're cleaning the debris. People need to sleep at night. They're going to keep bringing more and more people in. Find out what charity, maybe it's the Red Cross, maybe it's something else, and send them 100 of these things. Because these workers are going to be out there 12 hours a day. And, and trust me, in southwest Florida, in October, it can get quite hot. It can get quite hot into November. And these people have bedding and can sleep at night. They can, the faster they can get this debris out and get everything started. So I, I think this is a good, a great idea for hurricane relief for, for southwest Florida. I really do. And I think the, the workers and people and, you know, just ordinary people in their house, the toilet that is backed up, it doesn't work. There's no electricity. You're exhausted. You're tired. And this gets you a 25 percent better night's sleep. Man, you, 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 your money is going to really help people here. I, I think they should think about that. Or, or maybe they could set up a distribution center and people could buy it and send it to them. That's a great idea. That's what these people need. So you out there, I'll you, you, you I, listeners, that's a good idea for you as you're trying to help people down in Florida. This yeah. would be a good thing to send. Absolutely. Send them and to distribute it. And, you know, it, you got elderly people. I mean, no, no one can get out, all the streets and debris and everything. This thing was, DeSantis messed this up so much. And if you just, the, the problem when you live there, there's two ways out. One it was the interstate, which is, of course, <laughs> when you are an evacuation 21 hours before for millions of people, that's not going to work. And the other ones were like two lane roads over to the eastern part of the state, which blocked like crazy. I mean, what a, what a mess. But it is a mess, but this is, something, yep. this is something you can do to help those people. So go to right. trymiracle.com slash war room Absolutely. to try it today. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Be sure to use our promo code war room at checkout to save 40% off and get three free towels. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Brand. Go to trymiracle.com slash warroom and use the code warroom to claim your free three-piece towel set and save 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash warroom. Thank you, Miracle Brand, for sponsoring this episode. You know, you can also find the link in our show notes. Hey, Ohio, even though it's trending strongly, Republican red is usually a political battleground. No one better to analyze this than Howard Wilkinson of WVXU, the great NPR station in Cincinnati. Top, he was top political correspondent for the Cincinnati Inquirer. Howard, correct me, uh, but my impression is that Governor Mike DeWine, the Republican, is pretty much coasting to re-election, but the Senate race between J.D. Vance and Congressman Tim Ryan, the Democrat, is as close as it is bitter. Uh, absolutely. That's that's an accurate description of the situation now. And it doesn't surprise me a lot, really, uh, because this is a uh, state that is famous for ticket splitting. Right. You you, you know, Vance wrote the best-selling um, book, Hillbilly Elegy. It was really kind of critical, something condescending of his childhood experiences in Ohio. Then he left the state long ago mm -hmm. and only came back really for this election. Does that matter? Uh, I think it is mattering. I think it is a matter of concern for a lot of voters because uh, the Ryan campaign has been pounding at this uh, daily ever since uh, Vance won the primary, which he did with 33% of the vote and Trump's backing. But he left and he was uh, in San Francisco. He lived in New York. Uh, he made a whole lot of money. And then he suddenly shows up as the author of this best-selling book and decides that he wants to be the United States Senator. And there's a, it's not helping him. Uh, he, has, he has to explain that just about every day about, you know, because he had said things in the past about he didn't feel comfortable in Ohio. Yeah. And that's, that's, really not helpful, not a, that's really not a good way to start. Right. He's also forward. made a number of controversial uh, statements and assertions, including one where he seemed to be saying women should stay in a violent marriage. 
Yep. Being the good reporter that you are, you cited the full statement. I'll quickly read it. These, This is Vance. These marriages were maybe even violent, but certainly they were unhappy. And getting rid of them and making it easier to shift spouses like they change their underwear. Boy, that sure sounds to me like he's saying abused women ought to stay in marriages. Uh, it, it does. And it sounds that way to a lot of uh, people in Ohio, particularly women voters which is one of his big problems. And I've talked to him about that. And frankly, Al, I, I, his, his response to it was kind of uh, mixed up and it didn't make any sense. But uh, that statement is not helping him at all. And suburban women are a big, big factor in this race uh, right. because of Roe v. Wade, because of a lot of other factors. And he's uh, struggling, I know, uh, in that demographic. That's important. Look, the only Democrat who has won a statewide election, I think, in the last decade and a half is Sherrod Brown. Now, does Tim Ryan really have any of that Brown magic? Uh, in some ways, he does. And, you know, he's a uh, populist type. Uh, he's a, a very pro-labor uh, congressman. Uh, he comes out of that kind of mold. Uh, it's almost like a, a Howard Metzenbaum type uh, situation that, you know, Brown uh, reminds a lot of people of Howard Metzenbaum and Ryan reminds people of Sherrod Brown. Sherrod Brown has been out campaigning for Ryan uh, very hard and very uh, almost every day when he's uh, back in Ohio. And, you know, he he's had a fairly decent relationship with Portman uh, over the years, but I don't think he wants to uh, deal with Vance as the other senator yeah. from the state of Ohio. I can see why. James Carvel? Uh, well, th thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, there's uh, some, isn't there some Supreme Court races in Ohio. Coming oh, yeah. Up? Oh, yes. Very important. I think, you know, I've, I've written that uh, I believe that those – Supreme Court races are as as important or maybe more important than governor and, and the Senate race, because there is so much at stake, uh, whether you're talking about uh, abortion issues that come before the court, uh, redistricting, which has been a very contentious thing for the past year in Ohio, with the Ohio Supreme Court lined up against the Republicans in the legislature and having declared uh, at least seven plans for drawing maps uh, unconstitutional. So they, you know, the Republicans are trying to win back control of that process so that they can basically preserve their supermajority in the legislature and get whatever maps that they want and prevail on, on uh, any kind of abortion or pro-business type of issue that comes before the court. It's, there's a lot at stake. So, well, Ohio strikes me as, you know, first of all, it, it is a pretty, you know, compared to most states, it's pretty blue collar in that it has a, a high percentage of whites without a college degree. But it also has a, a, a lot of whites with a college degree. I mean, there's a lot of college oh, yeah. whites. You go around the state, and I mean, there's a lot of big ones. And do you sense that given the, the Dobbs decision, <clears throat> and just Vance's general misogynistic view of the world that we could have a distorted turnout but among women where it might contribute 54 percent as opposed to the normal 51 and a half or, or, or something like that that they would well, be fired up more fired up than them yeah James I mean there, yeah there's every indication that that's going to happen I've written about that a number of times too because the voter registration over the summer, uh, you know, women registering to vote was running way ahead of, of men registering to vote. And there's only one thing that can really explain that, and that's Roe v. Wade. And those new women voters are coming from the suburbs. They're educated, they're, uh, they're fairly well-to-do or very well-to-do, and they're mad and they're angry and they want to go out and vote. And I think it's going to be a big factor in the in not only the center race, but in the Supreme Court race and some of the down ticket races. So uh, asking you this question, I know it's impossible, but just do like a Kentucky windage, put your kind of finger there. How much 
do you think that will contribute to Democratic vote? So let, let's just say in a normal year, no. it's a plus seven Republican state. I, I, how much do you think it, this women well, start? You know, James, I, I think uh, that it doesn't have to be that much in terms of percentage. Yeah. If these yeah. polls are correct about the Senate race, and I think they are for the most part, that it's really tight. Yes, uh, that, you know, two or three percent can make a huge difference. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's not, you don't have to you don't have to convert everybody. You just have to no. convert two or three percent of them, maybe. Yeah. And I mean, that, the way I kind of look at you might you, you don't want to count it, but you might have a point and a half. In, in yeah. The free well, right. Back, you know, it's kind of That's hard. Right. I tell you, just on the back to Alabama, but universities and colleges in Ohio, I, I I went to give a speech at Miami of Ohio in Oxford. That, mm -hmm. That's one of the better looking campuses in the United States. I, Not I, as good looking as mine, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I know what I was expecting. And it's a beautiful drive up there, the western part of the state from Cincinnati. Yeah. It, 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 it is. And some countryside in Ohio, I can tell you that. Boy, they got, and they, James, you're right, they got some great colleges there. <clears throat> Howard, we're almost out of time. Let me ask you yeah. quickly about two congressional races. Republicans yeah. had a blatant gerrymandering, but in your hometown, Steve Shabbat, the last two cycles, Dems said we're going to take him out. They lost. They're saying right. it again. This is the year we beat Shabbat. Is it? Yeah, it could be. And here's why, Al. Um, this district has been redrawn. And now the entire city of Cincinnati is within the first congressional district. And that's a heavily democratic vote. Shabbat's district went from being uh, 3% for Trump to now 8% for uh, Biden. That's a, that's a big difference. And he's never wow. run in a district that had that many democratic voters in well, that's something, you know, conversely, Republicans thought they really, with this partisan gerrymandering, they were going to take out Toledo's Marcy Capture, who I think has been there for right. 40 years, uh, and because they made it really a plus R district, but they may have a candidate problem there. Uh, they have a definite candidate problem there. And and the guy, you know, Majewski, he just keeps, he, he dug himself a hole, and then instead of trying to climb out, he's just digging it deeper by the day. He's a big Trumper, and what he lied about his military record. That's correct. That's uh, you know, AP reported uh, did some pretty good reporting on that. Well, that's something, James. You have a final question. I, I, I do. Yeah, I'm gonna give you a true false. Okay. All right. Say, Joe Burrow is the most popular athlete in Cincinnati since Johnny Bench. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nah, not yet. Not yet. Really. Okay. You know who the most popular athlete right now is? Who? Joey Votto. Joey Votto still, he's good. I mean, he's kind of oh good. wow, and he's a terrific boy. guy. Yeah. People love him. I mean, he's a great guy. Yeah. People love the guy. Yeah, yeah. Burrow might still, be soon. Yes, I would still say Howard, the greatest athlete in the history of Cincinnati, is the Big O. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, he's he was amazing. I saw him play when I was a kid. Uh, hey, you've been terrific as part of that. Every week we can try to look at one state. Ohio is going to be a big state to watch on November 8th, particularly that Senate race. So thank you very much, Howard Wilkinson. I know you had a busy thank afternoon. You. Great, great commentary, Howard. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. And anytime you need me, just give me a holler. Will do. Okay, now for those terrific questions from our listeners. This is, I really love this segment. A lot directed at you today, James. Jody in Pineville, Louisiana. Where's Pineville? Oh, my God. Rapids Parish, the oh. first home of Louisiana State University. Wow. Well, Jody yeah. says in the Bayou State, we have benefited from two terms with Governor Edwards. But now I fear, unless Mayor Mitch stands up to focus on Louisiana instead of national aspirations, Democrats will lose the governor mansion. Any hope you can give me, Brother Carville? Well, first thing, let me concur with you about our, our terrific governor, Governor John Bell Edwards. I, and I've been very clear that this, I, I think he's the best governor of Louisiana in my lifetime. And one of the reasons I give him bonus points is he's had to deal and get things done with, uh, to say the least, some uh, 
just say off-center legislators and be kind about that. Uh, I, Mayor Mitch, I don't see, couldn't couldn't win a statewide election in Louisiana right now. I, I just want to be pragmatic and truthful here. It's going to be very difficult for a Democrat to win. And the the, the nightmare scenario, of course, is Jeff Landry. And that would be anybody's number one priority is not Jeff Landry. Uh, he's the attorney general, James? He is. And, and he's not just an odious man ideologically. He's really odious. He's also odious ethically. Uh, and he's got other odious people hanging around with him. And if he became our governor, it would... It, it, the, the state is in no position to get set back any further than this, and it would be a gigantic step back for Louisiana. So if, if, if I had to pick, if there was a Democrat or a Republican, in, in, in the, we, of course, we have that open primary, that I thought would have a better chance to beat Jeff Landry, I would actually vote for the Republican. Yeah. That, that's, how, that, that, that's how serious it is. I mean, there are times when you... you, you you can't do what you want to do. You have to do what you got to do. Right. And this is going to be one of those times, I'm afraid. A trifecta odiousness. Uh, well, the next is from Zane in Massachusetts, in Western Massachusetts. Zane, I wish you told us where in Western Massachusetts. But Beautiful part of the world, I can tell you that. It sure is. Uh, he's, he's a big fan of the show and Magic Spoon, especially the healthy cinnamon toast crunch. His question is, is there any figure you see as being able to bring back even George Bush-style compassionate conservatism or are normal Republicans doomed to the same exile, exile ra rather, uh, as the Jacobites in English history? They are gone. Uh, I am sorry. Uh, you ain't going to get them back again. You ain't going to get moderate Republicans. And I'll tell you this, if Republicans have a big day on November 8th, it is A, a validation, I think, of all the bad things they have done over the past several years, and B, it is it will just be affirmed once again as the Trump party. Some of these people, the Mitch McConnells of the world and the, uh, you know, the Rob Portmans and some of these other Republicans like to pretend, you know, if we just win an election, we can govern, we won't have to worry about Trump. They don't know who's going to be coming to Washington. Uh, so I'm sorry, Zane. Uh, you, you ain't going to see the George Bush styles. You ain't going to see the Charlie Bakers. Uh, they are yesterday in this current Republican Party. Yeah, of course they are. And, 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 and again, the, 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 the person in charge, the people in charge of the Republican Party are Republican voters. Okay, Trump, he just occupied a place because he agreed with him. And, they, and again, I've said it time and time again, they're really, you know, angry, stupid people. And when angry, stupid people vote, they vote for other angry, stupid people. It's, it's inevitable, and that's you know that's the way democracy works. A match for each other, John yeah. in Georgia. John, again, good question. I just wish you told us where in Georgia. Yeah, big state. But anyway, 159 counties. I think he says these faculty lounge. I wonder where he got that term. Yeah. These faculty lounge Democratic socialists were losing like a blue badge of bullshit with a lot of us former Republicans in the suburbs and cities ripe for the taking, is there room for a new, improved, DLC-esque organization for us moderate center-left, or even center-right, but not a goddamn lunatic to join? Tim Miller calls us Red Dog Democrats. Great name, but who, what can we turn to to get organized? Not just support candidates, but run for office. Well, first of all, I want to assure you something. Yes, they are part of the Democratic coalition, which we invite you to join. They're a very small part of it. They're the smallest part of the Democratic coalition. And by the way, they're talking about the faculty lounge. It's the only majority white segment of the Democratic Party because educated white people are running, <clears throat> running everything they get their hands on. But you're, you're just <clears throat> when you're, you're a Democrat, you're part of a coalition. The, to be in a coalition is to experience some discomfort. I think these people are essentially nothing but, but troublemakers. They, tell me the last time one of them ever, get, ever ran against a Republican. All they do is run against other Democrats. And then they go to Nevada, the most, I think, arguably the most successful state party, Democratic Party in the entire country, and they take it over. Yeah. And 
the, the, the amount of damage that they've already done to this brand, I, I, I'd just be, I have no evidence of this, but if you ask me to start an investigation to how the DSA is funded, I bet you if I look hard and long enough, there's the Coke, Charles Koch has a cutout funding them because that is the most valuable organization to mega voters that exist on the face of earth. Yeah, sure is. Hey, next we have John in Chicago uh, who asked, he says, I have no issue with helping out other states when a natural disaster occurs, but a state like Florida with their Republican leaders criticizing the blue states that have an income tax and say these states overspend, et cetera, while they pay no state income tax. How many times the federal government rebuilt Florida after a hurricane? At least these Republican leaders could have some humility and thankfulness. You know, John, uh, I don't think I'd bet a lot on them showing any humility and thankfulness. And I think we ought to do everything we can to help those poor people in Florida. They're not responsible for some of the, the outrageous and even asshole comments that Marco Rubio and, and Ron DeSantis have made. And I'll bet you I haven't looked at it lately. Uh, my guess is that Florida probably gets uh, more from the federal government than they pay in. I, I know what, New Jersey is either New Jersey or Connecticut pay more in for what they get out than any other state, and it's a hell of a lot more than Florida. That, in a, that, that the magnitude of this screw-up is not even close to being appreciated. And the reason it's not is that we'll, like you, you, you talk about Katrina, there's so many more people that this is going to affect and they were all building these non-code houses on barrier islands. They, they, it's going to be a, a, a mess like you can't believe. And the other thing, boy, if you want orange juice, you better stock up now because the price of orange juice is getting ready to go through the roof. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, James, the next question is from John in Wenatchee, Washington. I think I have that right, John. Wenatchee, Washington who asked, why hasn't the January 6th committee subpoenaed Representative Jim Jordan and other elected members of the House or Senate to appear before the committee to provide information on their involvement in the January 6th assault on the U.S. Capitol? First of all, I tried to appoint him to the committee, and Pelosi correctly said no, and Kevin McCarthy. But when people say this committee has no balance, they're exactly right. And, and the reason it doesn't have balance is that's what the Republicans chose. I mean, if you talk about stupid decisions and, you know, Putin's stupid decision to invade Ukraine, or Bush's stupid division, decision in Iraq, all right? Not, it's not a war, but this is, McCarthy made one of the stupidest political decisions about it. And they, they know if they get Jordan in there, he's going to do nothing but grandstand and lie. So I, 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 I just work around him. Yeah, he also, uh, this is a guy who may be the Judiciary Committee chairman who, uh, to put it mildly, if you look at that Ohio State uh, yeah. <clears throat> athletic sex scandal, he, uh, was, he was a culprit and he got away with it. It's, it's, it's totally, the evidence is totally overwhelming. Six Ohio State wrestlers said he knew about what was going on uh, and he participated in the cover-up. And just out, absolutely outrageous. A real Jim Jordan is a thug. Well, if Herschel Walker can get 47% in Georgia, then I'm, I'm telling y'all, people will not listen to me and say, they have really stupid voters, all right? Well, and, and that, that, you know, you talk about, you live in central Ohio, and, you know, you think that molestation of, of athletes is a bad thing, but you know what? At least Jim Jordan doesn't want to give health care to, to working people. I don't know what's crazy. Yeah. Michael in East Brunswick, New Jersey, said, I've been looking for the Republican plan to lower the price of bread, etc. I can't <laughs> seem to find it. Why? Because there is none. Why can't the Democrats campaign on a total Republican absence from any plan to help? Couple with Dobbs, uh, shouldn't that work? You know, Michael, you're absolutely right. Uh, but I think Democrats can ill afford to totally run away from the inflation issue. It's on people's minds. Gas prices have started back up again. And, and Democrats have something, they have something to say. They can talk about that 
uh, Inflation Reduction Act, it may be an exaggerated name that just passed, but they really are dealing with lowering prescription drugs, setting a cap ceiling, making insulin much more affordable. Uh, I think with the gas prices going up, some Democrats may want to call for a federal gas tax holiday. You can argue how good an idea it is, but it's certainly something that's reasonable to talk about. And, and, and I think Michael makes a good point. All Republicans say is there's bad inflation because Democrats are bad. Biden has caused it all. This bill has caused it all. Well, no, it's a global, uh, it really is a, um, a, a global question. Uh, but I don't think Democrats in this last month, James, should run away from the issue. Well, well first of all, I, I don't know what the Republican position on the cost of living is. I, I know their position is it's bad, a, a position that I share with them. I don't know of a single Republican solution, all right? Some amorphous, you know, thing they always mumble, cut spending, but we never know what spending. They well, James, cut. it's also going to be to cut taxes for rich people. Yeah, it worked so good in in in, in the UK, did it? The the, the, right. the brilliant markets who 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 everything the bond vigilantes, you know, the, the UK made the Wall Street Journal editorial page expose them for the fucking idiots they are. Well, they just tried to emulate Sam Brownback's uh, approach yeah. in Kansas. We know how well that ended. Well, my friend Governor Kelly, she's racking up one Republican endorsement after another. Uh, good. From a, Yes, she's doing. Uh, she, and, 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 and but you know, an untold she could win that thing, couldn't she? She can. I, 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 if anything, governor she Kansas. might be a slight favorite. But but the the the, the one thing, and it's it's not very much, and we get all appropriately depressed by the direction of the Republican Party. But they are a, in Pennsylvania too. You know, they, they, they there are a significant number of Republicans who are coming out and actually putting their name on something. And it's not just, you know, uh, Tim Billa and Charlie and John V. Lass and Crystal and, you know, Stewart and those guys. That's, they are, a, and, you know, I don't like to give Republicans credit for much, but uh, you, you look at these different races and see how many Republicans are endorsing the Democrat, it, it's not going to bring a lot of Republican voters on. But there's a lot more than you think. It's there's impressive. It's impressive at the local level uh, and, yeah. the, and the county chairman. But, boy, uh, there are not a whole uh, lot of profiles in courage in Congress. Yeah, sure. you, you look at the number of Republicans for Laura Kelly. Uh, former Republican Governor Bill Graves, who was very yeah, moderate. I, he was almost like a moderate Democrat. It, 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 Kansas has a majority Democratic Supreme Court in large part because – so the guy that Governor Graves appointed back in the 90s, and he's come out. And and other people have. It, 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 it's not going to sway that Republican hardcore voter, but there are some that it's more than just the, the Washington types that have stepped up. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of giving them credit, but I'll give them a little credit here. Now for the outrage of the week. James, the New York Times reported this week that New York University dismissed a distinguished professor of organic chemistry, Maitland Jones Jr. Why? Why was he dismissed? According to the Times story, it was because a number of students signed a petition against him because he was too tough a grader. You know, James, if that was the standard years ago, you and I, when you and I were in college, we could have cleared the faculty at LSU and Wake Forest. This is, this is I mean, a couple more thoughts. That his chemistry department... They noted Dr. Jones was denied any due process. As for those students complaining about low grades, I have a solution. Take an easier course. It's just so damn stupid. Well, it's so stupid on so many levels. First of all, NYU is a top tier American university. I mean, it just is, all right? And, and organic chemistry is not supposed to be easy. It is by nature a hard course, and most of the people that take it in pre-med. Well, you know, if you don't want to take hard courses, don't go Don't go to pre-med. Don't go to medical school, right? It, 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 it would be like saying that the, the exam is too hard to be a pilot. This is so asinine. NYU looks so bad. You know, I said, of course, I'm much different than teaching organic chemistry at NYU than teaching communications at LSU or Tulane. But they'd come into my office and say, you got to understand higher education is different, James. You got to look at these students as consumers. Fuck that. They're not consumers. They're students. I'm their professor. I know more than they do. Why am I here? Why are they here? And now 
you know, NYU is so scared. They probably got seventy thousand dollars a year in tuition, and at the bottom of all this, they're just scared they're gonna lose somebody paying full freight. I mean, and this guy's like wrote the textbook. Well, you're teaching pre-med students at an elite American university organic chemistry. God damn it, it's supposed to be hard. Of course hard. it you is. Know, you, yeah, if you go take quantum physics at MIT, it's hard. My advice is don't do it. Yeah, okay? But but that's one thing. You can you can cook. Could you help a guy, a student out, you know, struggling with English at a community college? Of course you can. This is so stupid. These people... And by the way, read the story on the Guggenheim Museum and, and that lady, Miss Spector, show you how goofy these people are. So my outrage is, you know, when DeSantis, so, so you see what happened in Southwest Florida, right? What are you going to need there? You, you are going to need roofers, drywall people, backhoe operators, carpenters, bricklayers, concrete pourers, things that you, you've got, buying workers that you can't think of. And guess where you're going to get them from? Immigrants. Immigrants, dude. And before this is over, you're going to see a sign, welcome to Florida, a sanctuary state. Because there's no, you're not going to get any roofer from some old fat guy in the village that's part of your base. You, 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 you should send buses to the Rio Grande Valley, to El Paso, to Niagara, to, to the California border, and put a sign up saying, high wages, no paperwork. Get on board. Because that's the way it's going to work, Governor D. Katrina. And pulling all kind of crazy crap stunts in Martha's Island. They're not doing that anymore. They, they're shitting in their pants in Tallahassee right now, I can tell you. It's like outrage. Welcome to Florida. So, Governor Ron DeSantis and, you know, X million Republicans welcome you to our sanctuary state. You are welcome. Will not bother you at anything like citizenship tech, tech tests or green cards or anything. Just start pouring concrete and right. save our ass. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics Roar Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Now, following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the links to our sponsors today, Blinkist and Miracle Brand. Check them out in the show notes. We deeply thank you for supporting them. When you do, you help make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.